Well, good morning. We will, Lord willing, work through our way through the Noahic Covenant today, named after its federal head, uh, Noah. A uh, covenant made with with all mankind. Let's let's ask for the Lord uh, to help us as we study His Word. We'll be looking at a couple of things in uh, Genesis chapter nine and looking at at four key features or four aspects of this this Noahic covenant that are are critical for us to understand. Let's let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for your mercy to men who are wholly undeserving. Thank you that in uh, in the, the promise made to Noah, the covenant that you made with Noah, that we can rest assured that your your plans and purposes will be brought to completion. That you will sustain this world as, as, as the place and the context in which you work out your plan of redemption for human beings. We pray that you will give us understanding and, and cause us not only to have uh, minds that are better equipped to understand the Word of God, but hearts that are better suited uh, to worship you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As we think about the Noahic Covenant, I want to read the first paragraph in Genesis chapter 9. You, of course, know the story. Uh, the, the, we looked last time at the effects of the fall and what happens in due course in a, very, in a relatively short period of time. We don't know exactly how long, but a relatively short period of time in, in, in light of all of human history Man has degenerated from that first sin of Adam and Eve to such an extent that the Holy Spirit comments on the state of man that the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil all the time. We have to to contemplate the implications of that. The thoughts of men's hearts were only evil all the time. It's superlative language. It's negative superlative language meaning that man is, was without hope and the effects of sin had run its full course. And, and God looks upon the state of men and exercises a just condemnation on mankind. He would have been just to wipe out everyone, but he spared Noah, his three sons, and their wives. So there were eight human beings that God placed on an ark He caused the fountains of the great deep to burst open, the heavens to burst open in rain, and Noah and his family were saved through the ark. We've looked before about the typology that exists in the ark. It is is through that ark that men were carried safely through, and that ark points us to Christ. It is through the ark of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are carried safely into eternity. But Genesis chapter 9, we see the aftermath. We see after the flood waters have subsided, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives, that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. From every man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. One of the first things that we see in the Noahic Covenant is there are echoes here. When when we see things like be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, our minds should be taken back to God's original commands to Adam and Eve, and particularly to Adam. Here in the Noahic Covenant, we have a new kind of creation statement. The flood event saved the lives of, of, of Noah and his family, but it did nothing for their spiritual state. It did not save their souls. And now they, they are living still in a cursed land. 
the, the Adam was cursed and said it was by the sweat of his brow that the land would produce a harvest. And, and even among that harvest, there would be thorns and thistles. So Adam and Eve were placed in a, in a state of innocency, moral uprightness before God, and placed in a, state of, in, a, in, a, in a temple environment, in the garden, place of worship. Unlike that, Noah and his sons are not in a state of innocency. Their, his sons and their wives, Noah and his wife, are all still marked by sin. But yet they are given a commission, the same commission or similar commission that Adam was given to go and multiply. This is a cultural mandate. This, this covenant is a, a covenant that rules a kingdom. And one of the things that's important for us to understand, this is a foundational piece because it, it is what we refer to as the common kingdom. It's the kingdom of all men. It is the earthly kingdom. It is, it is the present, the here and now. And it includes every living thing. Certainly every man, woman, and child, but every living thing. Noah is the federal head, and his federal headship reaches to all generations as long as this covenant remains active. Now, how long will this covenant remain active, according to the Scriptures? Until all things are completed. The Lord promises he will not destroy the earth. He will not destroy it again by water until all things are completed. He said, I establish my covenant with you, verse 11, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. In this creation covenant, this, this common kingdom covenant with Noah, <clears throat> the commission is for every man and every woman to work. To work. Not every job is the same. Does it mean that men and women have exactly the same task in this common kingdom? But everyone is called to work. God has called all mankind to be workers, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to master it. One of the things that uh, Dr. Renahan points out, again, we're, we're working through the mystery of Christ. This is in chapter 5. I believe it's chapter 5. chapter 5, <clears throat> is that Noah's covenant is not a covenant of salvation or eternal life. The success or failure, says Dr. Renahan, of Noah and mankind in obedience to these commands will neither bring them eternal life nor will it bring upon them eternal death. Man is already condemned in Adam. And the only escape known at that time was God's promise, promise that we considered last week. That promise there in Genesis 3, 15, that God would raise up the seed, a singular seed of the woman, who would crush the serpent's head. It was only by believing in God's promise of a future deliverer that Noah and his sons were saved. It is not by means of the covenant that God makes with Noah. It's an important distinction to make. This covenant serves the purpose of promoting the fulfillment of that greater promise of salvation but it is not the promise of salvation. The Noahic covenant does not accomplish the redemption of mankind, but it does provide the physical earthly context in which that plan of redemption will come. Because apart from the Noahic covenant, think, of, think this through, the Noahic covenant is the context and the promise of a, an enduring physical world in which the second person of the Trinity can clothe himself in human flesh and walk among us. It's a tangible world, and we have a Redeemer who's going to be a tangible, physical, human Redeemer. And the Noahic Covenant preserves the context in which such a Redeemer can come so that our, our both bodies and souls can be redeemed. So this is a new co commission of, of reproduction and expansion, and it's a means whereby the seed of Eve can be born. There's a second feature. The first one is that, that new creation, this, this new commission. It is a sort of recapitulation, meaning it's, a, it's a, a restating of something that's gone before. It's a recapitulation to some degree of the covenant made with Adam. But the Noahic covenant <clears throat> and the covenant of works are not the same covenant. They're two distinct covenants, but they're both operative at the same time. Under the covenant of works, we've already seen, 
Every man stands condemned. Every man, woman, and child stands condemned under the covenant of works. Because Adam was the federal head, and by his natural generation, by his natural issue, all of us have been born, and we bear the stain of his sin. We bear the condemnation of his sin. And so, too, the Noahic covenant is universal. It applies to every man, woman, and child. Everyone is born under the Noahic covenant, because it is, it is the overarching covenant that governs creation. But there's a second feature that Dr. Renahan points out that's helpful to think about. It's, it's this, what he calls judicial rep- retribution. In this covenant, the text that I read a moment ago, there is a stipulation. There is a, not, and we need to understand this not so narrowly as it only defines a penalty for a specific crime, meaning murder or manslaughter. But, all, but what it is, further than that, is it is a mandate for cultures, for human beings to establish cultures and societies with rules that punish evildoers. That's the requirement. Look what he says back in chapter 9, verse 3. For your lifeblood, or, I'm sorry, verse 5, and for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from every man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. These are universal laws. This is a universal law. A society doesn't get to decide. We are anti-capital punishment. We won't institute this. Mankind doesn't have that authority. This is a covenant that's binding upon all creation. All mankind wherever they live, whenever they have lived, are bound to this command. There is, a, there is a command by God applying to all of society, all of societies, that justice is required. And, and in this, this is the foundation here, so when we get into the New Testament, we turn to places, for example, like Romans 13, where Paul teaches that the government is instituted by God and that it bears the sword of God's wrath to punish evildoers. Well, where does Paul get that? That's rooted in the Noahic covenant. God has given authority to mankind to punish evildoers. See, God is the author and the giver of life. God alone has the authority to take a life, but he can delegate that authority. And he has delegated that to men and to societies to punish evildoers. So basically, uh, Dr. Renahan notes, human societies have two basic related jobs, to preserve life and to preserve the family. To preserve life and to preserve the family. That's what's rooted here in the Noahic covenant. A death penalty that is justly deserved and prescribed is an act of God's judgment on the murderer and an act of deliverance for the society in which that murderer committed his crime. That's on the very top of page 81. What the Noahic Covenant <clears throat> establishes is, is the foundation, the moral foundation, for mankind <clears throat> to organize into societies and to police themselves. This is to establish rules and laws, and primarily to protect life and to preserve families. So when we think about this, when a society says, we are wiser than God, we are more just than God, we are more moral than God, and we will not take the life of a murderer, are they being just? No, not at all. In fact, they are abusing the very authority that God has given. It's an abuse of authority. It's it's turning that authority, and the the reason it's an abuse of authority is because it's turning that very authority against the innocent. When the evildoer is not punished, who ends up being punished? The innocent. The innocent party. And we see this not only with murder. That's that's a, a glaring example. When someone is duly and justly convicted of murder and They're sentenced to 25 years, and they're out in 10. And they're returned to the streets, possibly to repeat their crime. 
who suffers. The innocent suffers. And Dr. Renahan asserts this, and I think he's exactly right. There, there is no more blatantly sinful example of this in our society than the active, government-sponsored, government-funded, government-promoted slaughter of unborn babies. What could be more unjust than that? And yet, rather than punishing the evildoer, we promote it under false language like choice, freedom, liberty. In fact, we'll see in the sermon today in, in Psalm chapter 5, the driving theme in that psalm is the idea of false language. It's the idea of deceitful tongues. It's the idea of saying one thing, but really meaning something else entirely. Saying one thing that sounds peaceful and nice, but, but the actual, it's, it's violent and horrific. That's precisely what abortion is. The Noahic Covenant explicitly would for, not only forbids that act, but forbids a society for promoting such a thing, for even tolerating such a thing. And the Noahic Covenant is this governing covenant that, that over, oversees and, and is the foundation for the common kingdom of all mankind. So it's, it is to protect life, but it is also to preserve the family. And once again, when you have society that not only tolerate, but actively promote all kinds of philosophies and laws and practices and institutions that undermine the very family that God has established, that seek to redefine marriage, that seek to, to allow for all kinds of perversions and celebrate those. This is not only contrary to the moral law of God, but it contradicts the Noahic Covenant, which is the foundation of human society. These are no small matters. When we consider the, you know, as we've got even in our political cycle and, and debates going back and forth of one party and another party and all these different issues, when, when we look, boil things down and look at these fundamental issues and we look at groups and parties and uh, movements and institutions, that are actively opposed to the protection of life, that are actively opposed to the promotion of families and welfare, the welfare of, of the family as God instituted it. We dare not, as Christians, look at those things and say, these are matters of indifference. These are things that we can simply overlook, or we, we can just prefer one choice over the other. We don't have that kind of, of liberty. These are our most basic commitments, not only as Christians, but as human beings, to protect life and to preserve families. There's a third feature of the Noahic Covenant. There is that, that creation commission, there's a judicial retribution, but there's also a promise in the Noahic Covenant. I alluded to it a moment ago, but if you'll turn back into Genesis 9 again, Look at verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. That's a pretty comprehensive covenant, isn't it? Who are, the, who are the parties to this covenant? God, Noah, his sons, your, their offspring after them, and every living creature, the birds, the livestock, every beast of the earth, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. This is, this is a covenant not only with mankind, but all of creation. Verse 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me 
and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. When we think about this, and, and you've, you've heard this said before, I'm sure, you've seen this observed, but when we think about the, the purpose of the Noahic covenant, the, the, the central mandate to protect life and to pro- protect the family, and yet the symbol of the rainbow, which should be a sign of that very covenant, has been hijacked and co-opted by those who both hate life and hate the marriage institution. What wickedness. And what bold wickedness. What an affront to God. And for any believer to, to, to co-opt such a sign. You know, when I see on, on social media and I see in profiles and people describe themselves as a Christian with a, a rainbow and then their pronouns and those kinds of things. What, 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 what dissonance there? What cognitive dissonance? What a what a, a, a conflict of conscience that must be. And what a wickedness it is to support such things. Verse 18, uh, the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered their nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, or backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. And that that simple phrase, he died, reminds us that that Noah was still in Adam's descent. Noah was under the curse of death. But even here, there is a preservation. There is a promise of preservation. Even here, God has promised that all these things, all that will come to pass in human history, the earth will not pass away until until the time of my completion, until the time that the seed has come and all the plan of redemption has been accomplished. There is, there is a promise here in this covenant. In a repetitious manner, make, God makes it clear that his covenant applies to all people, in fact, all creatures. He designates the rainbow as a visible promise of this reality. And this promise is not conditioned upon man's obedience. He doesn't say anywhere to, to Noah and to his sons, as long as you are righteous, the earth will continue. It's an unconditional promise. It doesn't depend upon the performance or the works or, the, or even the righteousness of men. The sun is going to shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous. The rain will fall on the just and the unjust. But never again will a flood destroy the earth. The reason, the purpose for this preservation is for one reason. It's to provide a stable platform, a a, a stable context in which the seed of the woman the second person of the triune God will come and bear the flesh of man, take on the flesh of men. And God has not destroyed the earth. He will not destroy the earth until he has fulfilled every last promise to his people. So despite the hand-wringing and the worrying and all of the anxiety-producing howls that you might see in the news about the state of the earth and, and how things are being overpopulated and uh, I saw just this past week, there is a campaign, there's an organization out of, I believe it's out of Toronto, and they're doing a, a trial campaign in 
Minneapolis and one other U.S. city, city and it's called One Child, One Planet. And their, their goal is to promote families having one and only one child, and they, they've imagined that if such a policy were enacted for 100 years, the population of the earth would be reduced from 7.8 billion people to about 3, 3 billion people. Think about the social, economic, political um, catastrophe that would come from such a rapid depopulation of the earth. Same people who say, follow the science, follow the science, are, are, are not very scientific when they think about such things. That would be utter insanity. But it is also driven by a, a godless ideology that refuses to acknowledge the very foundations of creation. God has promised, and, and their, their, their premise, of course, is that the world is overpopulated and, and would not allow for the earth just doesn't have the resources for such population. What would God tell Noah to fill the earth as an act of obedience to him and at the same time promise the earth will sustain you in seed time and harvest, season after season? Is God such a God? Why would any Christian believe such a thing? Is God's word true or not? Has God said, go do something, but I'm not going to provide the resources for you to do that? When has he ever done that? In all of human history, maybe one occasion where God has commanded something and has not provided for his people to do it. It's always been the case. There's a fourth feature in the Noahic Covenant. In addition to that creation commission, in addition to a, a, a decree to establish judicial systems and just laws, in addition to a promise of the preservation, there is also a context in which God's common grace Will, will be lived out even in a cursed kingdom. Even in a fallen world, there is a promise of God's common grace. The kingdom of creation is governed by two covenants. We have, at the same time, the covenant of works by which all men are condemned, and also the Noahic covenant, which stabilizes this cursed world so that redemptive history can play out and God's promises can be fulfilled. These, these Noe, this Noahic covenant and, and the covenant of works are not, are not at odds with each other. They're two distinct covenants, but they're not in conflict at, at all. Uh, they're both active covenants by which God governs mankind and by which God grants authority to mankind, particularly through the Noahic covenant. Through, through, through Noah, all men are called to, to build culture, to establish societies, to govern justly, to... Um, to apply uh, justice to all mankind. And, the, and, and it's the context in which the blessings of God and the promises of God are then applied, those common promises are applied to all mankind. So when we speak of this common kingdom, it exists in the realm of, of common grace. So it ought not surprise us when, as the, when we read through the book of Ecclesiastes, for example, a Kolohet, the teacher, wrestles with this concept that sometimes he looks out and those who work hard don't prosper. Sometimes the lazy prosper. Or sometimes the one who works hard and prospers dies young and loses it all and has no one of any merit to which he can give his inheritance. And Kohelet is, is puzzled by that. By the end of the book, he reasons through and says, well, here's, here's the end of the matter. Believe God and obey his commandments. This is the end of the matter. There, there is a uh, of some certain perplexity. There, Kohelet often refers to it as vanity. Vanity of vanities under this common kingdom. Sometimes it would appear that things don't make sense. And yet we have a God who rules all, who justly serves and governs all things. And the unbeliever in that context has every much a right to the promise of this common kingdom. And I think something is, even as believers, we need to remember that we are not more entitled to a piece of property, for example, than an unbeliever would be, because we're Christians. The common kingdom has promises given to every man. We are no more entitled to physical health than our unbelieving neighbor is, just because we're a Christian. The common kingdom belongs to every man. 
And we're going to see as, as we watch these covenants unfold, particularly beginning with the Abrahamic covenant, there's now, here's the covenant of works, here's the Noahic covenant, which apply equally to all men. But we're going to start to see, starting with Abraham, a calling out of a particular people of God, a special people of God, a people of his own possession. As Peter would refer to them, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So think about that. Those four things are, are key with the Noahic covenant. There is a creation commission. There's this judicial decree, this judicial mandate. There is a, a promise of preserving the world. And there is a, a common kingdom, cursed, but under common grace. And th- those are important for us, I think, to, as, as, as we live in this common world. We, we live as, as Christians with, with a dual citizenship. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We were also citizens of this common kingdom, and we have responsibilities in both spheres. Think, when we think about things like the civil government, the institution of marriage, those are common kingdom institutions. We know that civil government will not endure in, into eternity. That, that's a feature of this common kingdom. The institution of marriage will not endure into eternity. That is a feature of this common kingdom. So our, our pagan neighbors have every much as a, a right to the gifts and benefits and blessings of marriage as Christians do. But they also have every much the obligation that Christians do to maintain that institution as God created it. We have every much, the, uh, both we as Christians and our pagan neighbors have every right, have every privilege of seeing life come generation after generation. But we also have, we all share the same responsibility to protect that. So we have much in common with even our unbelieving neighbors under the Noahic covenant. And yet we as believers uh, are, are rooted in anchoring ourselves in the, the revealed word of God, his special revelation, which tells us <clears throat> how we can be reconciled to the God from whom we have been alienated by our sin. And questions about the common kingdom, well, just the common kingdom, but Noahic, the Noahic covenant and the implication of the common kingdom. This is, the, I think, when we, when we think about covenant theology, the Noahic covenant is often neglected. Uh, and we don't necessarily think about the implications of that, particularly um, when it comes to issues like abortion or homosexuality, capital punishment, or those things. We, we go to the New Testament. Uh, we look to the, maybe the red letters, and we look at what Jesus said, and we think about justice, and we think about mercy, and we think about those things, and we don't really think about the common kingdom and the, the common governing structure that God has not just provided to man, but mandated to mankind. That there is a, there is a requirement by God that's applicable to every society to maintain a system of just laws and to punish the evildoer. And it, is, it is, goes against the very created order when we fail to do that. So the question is, and I'll try, try to summarize it um, as briefly as I can. You're asking, how do, how, do we, how do we avoid the pitfall of 
sort of theonomy or dominionist sort of theology with respect to not only the Mosaic Covenant, and we can make those distinctions between ceremonial judicial laws and moral law, but also with the, with the Noahic Covenant. I think the shortest answer is, is that there is, there's often a conflation of common kingdom and the kingdom of Christ. Uh, how many times did Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world? How many times I mean, do, can we find in the Gospels where our Lord said, our kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world, and yet many will still conflate that and will look at the Noahic kingdom as if that is a, as if that is a distinctly Christian command, and it is not. And so what is lost is the fact that this is a common command given to every man, all of mankind. So, for example, with some of the theon- theonomic uh, theology systems, theological systems, that rely not only on the Mosaic Law, but yes, do go back and, and point to the creation mandate or the, quote, cultural mandate in Genesis, but also here in Genesis, or Genesis 1 and 2, but also Genesis chapter 9, and say, see, this is what the church ought to be doing, is, is, is exercising the crown rights of Christ. Well, there's nothing here in the covenant with Noah that talks about a particular people. It's talking about all mankind. Well, again, but, the, but it's a conflating of the two covenants. It's not making a distinction between a common kingdom. And that's the, that's the chief error of, of theonomy, is not making a distinction between a common, the common kingdom and the kingdom of Christ, the spiritual kingdom. Um, that, that is, it, it's not a surprise that theonomy had its roots in Presbyterian covenant theology, which doesn't make that spiritual distinction in the same way that we would make it as Baptists. Where we would say the entrance into the kingdom is by faith. It has nothing to do with our, our genetics. It has nothing to do with us being able to trace our bloodline back to Abraham, which is the dispensational error, nor does it have anything to do with us having believing parents, which is the Presbyterian or Pado baptist error. We, we would believe that the kingdom is spiritual. It is entered into spiritual. You must be born again in order to enter into this kingdom. So we, we would, unlike, say, for example, the Islam that says the kingdom is expanded by what means? The sword. You go and take a land, and you convert them by, at the tip of a spear. And as Christians, we recognize the, the common kingdom of man does go and, and divide in those ways. Nations conquer nations. That's happened throughout human history. But it is not the case that the church grows in that way or that the kingdom of Christ grows in that way. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Nor is that a distinct, distinctly Christian mandate to go and have children, to go and populate the earth. Nor is that a, a command to every individual person that every person has the, the responsibility to have, every, have as many children as they possibly could biologically have. But it is to society no more than it is my responsibility personally to make sure that, that evildoers are executed, for example. But that's, that's the, the responsibility of a society. That's the Noahic covenant. And here is the mandate for societies to promote life and to, pr- to promote families and protect life. And where, that, what I mean is conflated, it means they're, they're, they're kind of mixed together, that common kingdom mandate, and saying, well, that's a distinctly Christian mandate, and we need to... Um, you know, outbreed our enemies in order for the gospel to go forth. That's not that. That's a that's a conflating of those. Hmm. What does a prosperity gospel preacher do with the common kingdom? 
Um, he buys it. No, I don't. I don't uh, or sells it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, perhaps, perhaps the answer is he indulges too much in it. I mean, it's, it's too much of that wanting it here and now. Um, the idea of the little God theology. I mean, you, you, you yourself can subdue creation. You yourself are the one who can rule and reign and, and by virtue of, of basically wielding God as some sort of, of, of instrument or tool to get you what you want. I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So next week, uh, we'll begin a look at the Abrahamic covenant. It starts to get really interesting. It's not already interesting. Yeah, go ahead. That's a great question. How do we think through, on the one hand, we have we recognize there's a mandate for a society to have a just system that includes the execution of murderers. But then we also have compelling evidence within our present system that there are innocent men and women who have spent ample time in prison, perhaps have even been executed, uh, because they were falsely accused. Because either there was ins in insufficient testimony or false witnesses, and they've served um, half a life or more, and then DNA evidence or something else comes along later, and they're, 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 uh, the conviction is overturned. That, that's a, a, a... I don't know how to answer that. Honestly, um, I, I think we can't just simply throw out the concept of, of capital punishment and say capital punishment is inherently unjust because God says otherwise. In fact, he says it's unjust not to have capital punishment. But on the other hand, I think we have to look at the justice system as a whole and say, what, what are the problems here? And when we search the scriptures, we find a, uh, a robust system of testimony, of cross-examination, of having to provide witnesses and evidence in order to, uh, to convict the accused. And I think often in our system that isn't followed. And there is a, there, there are... I was I was down at the, the the main federal the court building in downtown Houston about a year ago uh, for a court hearing criminal court hearing and I'm I'm out in the a lot of the deals are done in the lobby if you've ever been down there and I'm sitting on a bench and I'm overhearing a an attorney meeting with a young man and the young man is is you know basically was was found in a car whole group of guys, and he's, he's had a prior conviction for a gun possession, not supposed to have a gun, and it was a gun in the car. So everybody in the car got charged. And the attorney's going through the options with him. And you can plead not guilty, and we can, we can work that out, but there's a good chance you'll be convicted anyway. Why? Um, he's, and, the, and the attorney went on to explain to him, you're... you're the jury is not supposed to consider your previous charge. But the reality is they, they, they may. Well, that's unjust. 
Um, how, do, how do we fix that? There's some fundamental issues. I don't know the answer to those. But I, I don't know that we can... I, I agree with you, what, what you said. I, I'm, I empathize with those arguments. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I empathize with them. I think they're valid questions to raise. How, how do we maintain a just system? And particularly when, for various reasons, the system is slanted. There's no question about that in my mind. The system is slanted. And, and certain uh, ethnicities and socioeconomic groups are not in the same court system that the wealthy guy on the other end of the building is in. It's two different systems I mean, in practical ways. And I think that's a problem. But we, we, we can't say we're wiser than God. We throw out what he's mandated to us because we, we, we say, well, it's not possible for us to be different. At least, at least that's our theory. No, and more and more, I mean, it's those who have the money to, um, it, it's, it's Apostle Paul sanctified the useless sports metaphors and, and in a legal system. It's, it's kind of trying to run out the clock. If you can, if you have enough, keep the, the attorney on retainer and delay, 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 eventually you'll get a deal. But if you don't have those that kind of money, you've got to plead early to a, to a, a deal that's not as favorable. And, or you face the, the, the prospect of going to uh, before a jury or before a judge with insufficient representation and insufficient preparation and don't really understand the system. Uh, it's a complex system. And, and if you don't have the, uh, an expert guide to walk you through that system and how the game is really played behind the scenes, you're at a disadvantage.
Well, I mean, the, 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 the narrative of the Noahic covenant is, is striking in the sense that here's the, here's the covenant laid out, here's the promises, and then immediately, what do we see? Noah engraved sin. And then the closing of that narrative, and he died. Just like everybody who went before him. The sin problem hasn't gone away. God wiped everyone off the face of the planet except for eight human beings, and sin remained. Which means the, the, the necessity of a redeemer who will restore true justice eternally is, is, is still needed by every man, woman, and child. Let's close there. Brother Q, will you pray for us?